ready, to be honest. <laughs> okay, folks, that's a good start. Right, so um, many of you will have uh, seen Ken on uh, TV, heard him on the radio. Uh, he has the Ken Monroe show. Um, <laughs> um, this could be very interesting. So here's our closing keynote. Please welcome Ken Monroe. I think this is probably the bravest we've ever been with a demo before. We're definitely going to be winging this one in a, in a big way. Will it all work? What do you think, Andrew? It, it's highly unlikely yes, to work. Yes, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the chances of this going to plan are very limited. But anyway, it's going to be fine. Um, so, as many of you probably know, we spend a lot of time doing hardware hacking, reverse engineering, firmware extraction, that sort of stuff. Um, an area of great interest for us recently has been DVRs. I'll explain why in a minute. But um, what I thought was most amusing is how these skills transfer quite easily into other things and thingies. And I'm sure some of you have seen a story in the press over the last couple of days, which is quite an interesting thingy, which we're going to go and talk you through the whole reverse, try and do it live. Um, hopefully, we'll get, uh, get it to pop, and everything will be good. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fine. Anyway, I'm going to start on the safe side of this. I will say this talk is definitely not suitable for work. If anyone would like to be offended, now's the time to leave, OK? Anyway, so I'm going to start with DVRs. It's an area that's interested us for a long time. Um, back in February last year, we started looking at a DVR, the MV Power DVR. It's a pretty cheap one. How much was it? It was about 28 quid, so it's off Amazon, really cheap. Cheap as chips, um, worth buying, just to have a bit of a play around with. Um, and what's, I think, frankly, got us about it was it was just utterly, utterly insecure. It makes some of the later DVRs, the ones that are vulnerable to Mirai, look positively secure. This one, for example, uses UPnP, opens port in 80 inbound from the internet. There's no Telnet on it, but bear in mind we're talking about before Mirai came out, so no one was really looking at Telnet. Port 80, inbound from the public internet. Okay, lack of encryption, bit of a problem there. Um, it had a web interface, but we thought, great, what's the first thing you do with uh, a web interface? Have a look on Showdown and found 44,000 of them, I think, sat out there on the public internet going, okay, this is worth spending some time looking at then. So it started poking around a bit, and this is where the train wreck started to happen. Um, the web interface has authentication, username, password. If you need to authenticate, all you do is you change the cookie values to anything. <laughs> anything, and it authenticates you. It really is that simple, which is just thinking, wow. So from this point, you can see people's video feeds, see what the cameras are seeing. Yeah, pretty invasive, but perhaps not critical. But then it gets really bad, because it's got an inbuilt shell command. So from the web interface, you just type append shell and your command. So you've now got root shell. Whoa. And this is getting quite serious, isn't it? So now we've got a potential pivot point onto the customer's network. Um, and we thought this was about as bad as it was going to get. But it got worse. Yeah, it, it, it got, got even worse. Yeah. It actually got even worse than this, which is really quite scary. Um, once we got the firmware off it and started looking at it in some real detail, we noticed an email address in there. Laura is here at yeah.net. And we started looking at the firmware, seeing how it was working, and realized that every six seconds, it was taking a still of the video feed and sending it to that mail address. Whoa. <laughs> Thinking, wow, this is, this is quite hardcore. Um, now, the credentials for the mail account were obviously in um, the firmware, and someone took that credential and authenticated the mail account and found all these stills as well. Now, we tried to disclose. We tried quite hard. Um, it was a bit of a pain in the backside, and they didn't respond to us. Um, so we had to stuff it. You know, we waited the uh, obligatory period of time and disclosed. And then we got an email from him. <laughs> In response to the email we sent several times previously, saying, you know, why won't you talk to us? Yeah, he asked us to take it down, didn't he, initially, and yeah. then uh, changed yeah. his mind. Yeah, he asked us to take, take the post down. I was like, really? Okay. Well, you could have replied to us before. But it was pissing us off, so we decided that we'd have some fun with him and stream the introduction to Button Moon frame by frame to him. <laughs> <laughs> it was without the audio, so he did miss out on the theme tune, which is my favourite <laughs> yeah. bit. Um, but, but in fairness... Um, I think it was accidental that this email functionality was left in. He, he claimed it was um, pre-production, but we got it from a production box. So clearly there's been some mishmash going on there, and some of the devices that were out there sold in public had this functionality, and we're shipping stills from your CCTV out to this third party, which was just a train wreck, didn't you think? Yeah, it's, it's the worst security I think we've seen in anything yet. But of course, that got us interested, didn't it? Um, so I'm sure everyone here knows all about Mirai. Um, that's when things started to get more, even more interesting. Um, that blog, by the way, the MV Power blog we put up, was the most hit blog on our website by quite some margin. Yeah, yeah. until 
Until Mirai. Yeah. <laughs> and then until something happened this week. Anyway, um, a few points I want to clear up about Mirai. Um, there's been a lot of um, misleading information. There's been some amazing work. Um, a lot of uh, kudos goes out to Brian Krebs and some people who worked with him. Did some really cool stuff, got the source code, analyzed the uh, credentials, but then made some mistakes when they're trying to attribute what the devices were that Mirai was exploiting. Um, and I think what they did is they looked through default credential sets and matched what they saw and then that must be a device. So what that led was um, a lot of people thinking that Mirai was actually about things like printers, routers, IP cameras, VoIP phones, routers, all sorts of crazy stuff. It's not. Mirai is all about DVRs. Now, we went through that list and spent some time f uh, filling in the gaps and correcting things. So, for example, there's a two-way speaker there, um, EVZLX. And I think the attribution they got was the password ZLXX, full stop, was the root password they didn't make the connection correctly. Actually, it's for QVIS DVR, and that's one we demonstrated about six months ago. Yeah, uh, live, on, live, on, on, live on the news by mistake. Live on BBC and forgot <laughs> to go through disclosure, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah, I know, they weren't very happy about that. Um, but actually, if you go through the rest of the default credential sets, you see, actually, it's all just DVRs. Mirai is DVRs, nothing else. Um, there are a few cases where it applies to um, CCTV cameras, but that's where it's an all-in-one CCTV camera and DVR. The process is exploiting the DVR helper process. That's the one it's going for. So just a bit of clarity there. Now, we thought we'd have some fun and see what else we could do. So we went out and spent a stack of cash on over 30 DVRs. Some new, some secondhand, some 20 quid, some 2,000 quid. So a complete range. And what we were interested to see is what did Mirai actually miss? Because what we loved about Mirai was that it was beautifully simple. It exploited default credentials over Telnet. Great, fantastic, how utterly straightforward. We wanted to see, well, if we're prepared to spend a bit more time, what else could we find? And the list, whilst it's still growing, is stonking. So we found DVRs that were vulnerable to Mirai, but no one knew about. We found extra creds over Telnet, extra root creds that Telnet could have used but didn't, so you could actually make Mirai more effective. We found DVRs that if... Um, had used Telnet, but put it on a non-standard port, so 1023, for example, so Mirai could have optimized itself that way. And we also, and this is quite scary, so Mirai doesn't persist beyond a power-off reboot. So you pull the power, Mirai's gone. And uh, along the way, we found a route to persistence. Andrew, do you want to talk about that? A yeah, so um, I wanted to find a way to fix Mirai, because the problem with these is you can't update the firmware. There is no firmware out there for these, so I thought I'd find a way to fix that. And I did find a way to fix it. I can't really discuss how. It's quite hard to find. But the problem is, if we release it, the guys who write Mirai can use that to persist on the boxes. So if they can act quicker than us to repair the boxes, and we can just tell users to do it, we can't actually do it ourselves, they're going to gain the upper hand. So we're kind of in this quandary. We don't know what to do about it, to be honest. Yeah, so we can fix Mirai, but in releasing the fix, you make it persistent. And that's kind of bad, really. But we found a lot worse than that as well. And this is still ongoing. We're still halfway through the project. We found a lovely shell over debug. Um, we got directory traversal and a lovely buffer overflow, which we think is going to lead to a nice Wormble remote code execution. Get in. So that makes Mirai 1 shed load worse. But the bit that made us laugh is that a few vendors have integrated DVRs with home security <laughs> systems. And we've seen cases um, where you can actually use Mirai, compromise the box, and then disable your house alarm. Wow. Or unlock the door, because some of them integrate yeah. locks as well. So you yeah. can unlock the door, turn the alarm off, and delete the CCTV. Well, it's just bananas. <laughs> it's like, wow, this is just fantastic. So we're actually going through disclosure on that bit with the vendor at the moment. So watch this space. Um, and then I think one bit that, uh, that just blew my mind is um, you're probably aware of the involvement of a company called Zhong Mai. Now, Zhong Mai build the, the firmware that runs on all these devices. Um, they got a, quite a bit of stick um, a little while back, and quite rightly so. Now, Zhong Mai, XM, they also do the ability to see your CCTV on your mobile. So they do a mobile app so you can stream your footage. That's called the XMI. Now, we found this list of daily changing SU passwords on the internet. So you can compromise certain DVRs using XMI system just by knowing the, the uh, one-time daily password. Wow. Now, it's a one-time pad, right? And that's always been the problem with one-time pads is transmitting them. Putting them on LinkedIn isn't a great way of doing that. <laughs> we found this on a Nigerian CCTV <clears throat> camera installer's um, feed on LinkedIn. So really, 
Wow. The thing is, even if we hadn't found it like that, reverse engineering the binary that does the authentication would have uncovered the same issue. So it's bad all around, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's just a train wreck, isn't it? And I, th I think where things got really interesting is, is starting to realise that actually Jean Mai are fundamentally responsible for almost all the Mirai-related problems that we see. They got very stroppy when they were first accused of having problems with the original Telnet issues. Actually, we think Jean Ma are responsible for the whole lot. Um, that's our perception anyway. Um, and that's really because we hit upon the mother load. I think, Andrew, you should explain this. Yes, yeah, so um, my house is just a stack of DVRs at the moment. Um, and I was looking into one particular one, the one just sat down there, and I'd Googled the serial number off it. And this page came up, wiki.xm030, and this is XM's um, wiki for developers. And it contains a lot of really quite juicy information. Now, it's all in Chinese, which makes it quite hard to read. Um, but we found this, uh, this thing called the, um, the, it's a repacking tool that takes the firmware and customizes it. So it gets your logo and it puts it into the binaries. It changes the telnet password. And this is the thing that's joined together XM through to all these different vulnerable DVRs. Cool. I think we should try and reverse one live. Yeah, um, so I think we're going to show you um, some stuff we can do with one of these DVRs. Now, this is all going to be live, which means it's probably going to go very badly wrong. Um, so what we've got here um, is a DVR. Um, it's an ARM-based machine. It's got quite a powerful ARM processor on it. It's got RAM, external flash, and so on. Um, and the first thing we do when we get these boxes, we want to get the firmware off of them. Because if we can get the firmware, we change a black box test where we can't see inside it into kind of grey box or white box. And this gives us a lot of power. And we've got so many different ways that we can manage to get the firmware out. The first one, and you see this on routers, loads of embedded devices, is a serial port. And that actually gives you quite a lot of power. Um, I'm going to jump through to... Um, well, first off, I'll show you on here. Um, what we've done is we've connected a serial console. So it's just three wires, transmit, receive, and ground, going from here. It's connected to a beagle bone black, which just receives the serial. When we come through to the right terminal window, we're already connected to it. I'm just going to reboot it so you can see what happens. So you immediately see stuff coming out the serial port. So the first thing that happens is U-boot, which is called the bootloader. Then it starts loading the kernel. Um, when we get to this stage where it's actually loading the kernel, the serial port shuts down. So this has closed off our access through to the device, um, which isn't very helpful for us. We can't get a root shell. Um, but there's ways around that. We can still pull the firmware. So the first thing I'm going to do is reboot it. But this time you'll notice it says press Control c um, to break out of U-Boot. So if I press it at the right moment, lots and lots of times, we get a prompt come up. This is the U-Boot prompt. We can type help, gives us a nice list of commands. It's a bit slow because it's serial, um, but one of the key ones is memory display. And what that does is allows us to dump the flash memory through U-Boot. So all we do to get the firmware, we recover this through the serial port, we reconstruct this ASCII representation of the firmware, it takes several hours, and we've got the firmware off of the device. That's just one way of doing it. Loads and loads of devices don't allow you to do this, though. Um, we've got other routes into the device. So the first one I'm going to show you is, is the obvious one, the Mirai creds. Um, so we've already got the Mirai creds here. Um, some of them are a bit weird. We still don't know what that bottom one's about, to be honest. <laughs> um, it worked on one of my honey pots, but <laughs> oddly. Um, so what we're going to do is a little tool called Hydra, and you can give it the creds, give it the IP address and the protocol. Let that... F oh, wait. Run that. It will try all of those credentials against the device. And hopefully, in a second, it will tell us what the root password is. Don't you need to finish rebooting it first? Um, it should be back up again. <laughs> oh, no, it won't be. Thank you. I'll reboot it whilst that's happening. <laughs> Good. I'm glad someone's on the ball. Um, so, yeah, once we're onto the device through Telnet, we can recover the firmware. So it should just take a second to come back up again. Thanks for the warning on that. Otherwise, it could have been there for some time. We're probably going to be there for some time. Um, we do have other attacks we can carry out against it. 
Um, I'll jump through to one of those actually whilst it's, whilst it's booting. So um, what we can do is we can carry out a glitching attack. When you can't just press Control C in U-Boot to escape out of U-Boot, we can perform a glitch. So we let the device load U-Boot and then we stop it loading the kernel. And it's really easy to do that. All we have to do is pull one of the, the, mem the data out pins on the memory chip down to zero. We pull that down to zero at the right moment in time. It can't read the kernel, but it can read U-Boot. So I'll show you how that works. And this is probably going to be quite challenging to do this live. Um, so right. we'll pull the power off the device. And I'll flip it over. Change it to the presenter so you can actually see what I'm doing. Now you'll see on here is a flash memory chip, this little black chip here. It's got um, 16 pins on it. The lower left-hand pin is the data out that goes back to the processor. Um, and to glitch it um, should be quite easy. All we need to do is connect between that and ground, and it will allow us to break out the U-boot console without doing anything through the serial port. So we jump back to here. I'll just show you that it's booting still. So you can see that's the normal boot there, and it will normally go to uncompressing the Linux kernel. And all I'm going to do, I've got a multimeter here that's just got a direct short between the probes. And I'm going to short between ground and here at the right moment in time, which is now. It takes a second. And you can see we've got the prompt again. So this attack, by pulling that pin down to low, it stopped the kernel loading. And we've got exactly the same situation we had before. So you can read the memory, arbitrary memory read, you can dump the flash. Um, so now we're going to reboot it again. Give that a second or two. And now we're just going to show how you can tell it into it, and we can still get the firmware off of it. And it, it really is key to our jobs in attacking these devices to work out what's going on with them, to be able to get the firmware and this, this change from black box to grey box. Right. Wait for the beep. Wait for the beep. Yeah, so um, you get really annoyed by the beeping on these. Every time it reboots, it beeps, and uh, it would be fair to say um, I've made this thing beep an awful lot during its sad, miserable, short life. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. It's also got this annoying habit of changing IP address. Come on. Let's see if it's just going to respond to that. Nope. Ah, live demos. Don't you love them? Ah, it's gone to 57. That's why it's not working. <laughs> right. So we'll do the Mirai cred. So it will try doing them. And there you go. Within a second, after you're competent enough to actually get the device booted, you've got root and the password XC3511. Um, and of course, it's really easy to just turn it into the device at this stage. So 10.42.0.57, root XC3511, and we're in this root onto the device. So this is exactly how Mirai worked. Now, if we want to get the firmware off of this device, we've still got a load of different ways we can do it. Um, the box has got a USB memory stick on it a USB port on it. So what we can do, get a normal USB memory stick, plug it into the back. It will show up, so just run D message, and you can see we've got SDA there, just a normal disk. Um, we can then go and mount this. And we've got access to the USB memory stick that you clearly see I've used before. And to get the firmware off of it, it's really quite simple. We just do a cat of one of the MTD devices, which is the memory in it, send it to a file. And now we've got MTD block 5. That's part of the firmware onto the USB memory stick. <coughs> Unplug it, bring it back to here. Now, that's quite useful. Um, what we quite often do with firmware is unpack it using a tool called Binwalk and try and find vulnerabilities. But we wanted to find some really deep vulnerabilities that looking at code and scripts probably wasn't going to give us. What we quickly found was when you were looking at this with Burp, was we found a buffer overflow on uh, a GET request to the device. So a very, very long GET request will cause it to reboot. So this is clearly not a good thing. But a, 
a denial of service buffer overflow is not that interesting. We want to turn that into an exploitable buffer overflow. And that can be really quite difficult on a device where you don't have the oversight to be able to you know, view registers like you do on a traditional machine. So what we do is we cross-compile something called GDB server. So GDB allows us to get debug access onto the device. Now this really has the potential to not work, so we'll give it a go though. So what we're going to do, I'm going to run GDB server. And it's going to be running on port 1234, and I'm going to attach it to the already running process, which is called Sophia. Uh, Sophia is the root of all of these problems. It's the binary that does the web interface, it does the debug interface, absolutely everything. So now we're connected there. I'm going to start GDB. I'm going to connect to it. And what will happen is as soon as you start GDB, it will stop the code executing. So now the web server on this device will be unresponsive. So if we, um, if we try going to the device on 57, nothing will happen. It just won't work. Um, so we come through to GDB, which press C, and it will continue. Now if we come back, we've got the web interface come up on the device. So it's pretty simple to do that. Um, now we can exploit that buffer overflow and actually see what's happening. So what we're going to do is just give it a really, really, really long string. Ignore that brand name, please. Yeah, that brand name's not there. <laughs> so lots and lots and lots of A's. A's is the standard character. It'll ask us to download a file. The second time it won't work. If I come back to GDB, it says it's a segmentation fault. So it's crashed due to a bit of memory being accessed that shouldn't... Type IR for the registers, and you can quite clearly see how R6 through to R11 are replaced with 41, the ASCII representation of A. So we've got arbitrary overwrite of registers. The program counter isn't showing 41s because it's actually moved several steps down the chain after we've overwritten it. Um, <coughs> but let's just say we're quite a long way through getting this into RCE territory at the moment. Cool. Right. I've got to explain about the mail. Yeah, so um, we've, we've been looking at this XM site, and they, they don't just make products like uh, uh, DVRs and stuff. They make other kind of household alarms and things, but there's this really weird one that we can't quite work out what it means. They've got this whole range of products called Look at the Mail. <laughs> what, what could that possibly be? It's a beautiful segue of the next part of our talk, I think. It is. Um, <laughs> More look at the female, I think, would be the better one for the next part of the talk. <laughs> oh, anyway, so that was giving you an insight into some of the crazy things you can do to get firmware out. And I thought what would be quite good fun was show all this hardcore work that we've done on um, DVRs and show how you can actually use basically the same techniques to get a persistent remote root on a sex toy. Yes. Anyway, so let's start. Um, a few years ago... We did a bit of work on a few sex toys, and we started working on this one. It's the Love Ents, and I, I was a bit shocked to discover that actually the field of teledildonics is quite a, quite a big one. It's quite a popular market. The idea being is that you, you hook this up to a mobile app, your partner you want to communicate has another similar one that actually looks a bit more like this. <laughs> and then, you would get, oh no, oh. And then over the internet, using a mobile app, you can control each other's thingies. And that's, yeah. That's Should we use the presenter? No, no, let's not even know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, it's, I was just a bit, felt a bit soiled just even understanding these, these uh, thingies existed. But I thought, fair enough, we need to go and do a little bit of research and figure out what we can, what we can find. Um, so the first major issue was that... Um, you can actually take stills um, during this uh, process. How do I get to There we go. Yeah, so you have video streaming live. And um, you can also take stills from these things. And one of the things that really shocked me when we actually started playing around was there was uh, a process that um, takes the bitmap that the, um, the mobile device takes and then renders it um, into a JPEG. And in the process, can you see where that's It's up a little bit just on... Where is it? That line there, oh, the there it it's is. over yeah. to the side. And the we discovered shot. that during the rendering process, it actually creates a temporary file in the SD card. So it's the emulated or sometimes physical SD card. So that's not really a good idea because that means that 
other apps can access those temporary files. They're not removed properly, which is really pretty worrying, as far I think, anyway. Um, but the bit that made me laugh even more is it's got a default Bluetooth pin of four zeros. So you could, in theory, if you wish, go out driving and attach to people's dildos and take control of them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we, there's some other things you can do. Once you've got access to it, you can, actually, you can drive it over a Bluetooth serial port. So um, we had some vibrator races in the office over Bluetooth serial. That was quite good fun. Um, and then there's, there's the other end of it as well. So we were initially working on this end, because that's, that's the suitable for work side, where we're trying to get the firmware out of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway. Um, and then where's the other end? Now, obviously, there's, there's a sheath in there, which after you, is removable, obviously. Uh, um, and this was not in my job description. No, it wasn't, wasn't it? <laughs> one of my colleagues, not Andrew, another one's colleague, needed to get the innards out in order to get to one of the chipsets to try and pull the firmware. So he shoves his fingers deep in to pull it out, at which point one of my other colleagues turns the Bluetooth um, serial interface on and inflates it so he's now stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and he's running around the office, two fingers stuck in a dildo. Like, oh, God. Yeah, we had fun that day. Um, but... The reason why we came back to um, sex toys, because frankly that was a bit of fun that we did two and a half years ago, is you've probably all seen the issue around WeVibe. Two researchers presented at DEF CON um, in Vegas last summer. I met them both, follower and got milk, both really cool Kiwis. Um, and what they discovered were a shed load of security flaws. But the one that actually got um, caused trouble was a uh, privacy invasion issue, because the manufacturer of the WeVibe device was collecting usage data. And that's kind of fine. You know, how do people use it? How do I improve my product? But they're also collecting location data, email addresses, and other things. So they actually could correlate that data to the individual, how you used it, when you used it, who you were, and where you lived. And that kind of, the, the, yeah, there was a class action suit, and it settled last week, I think, for 3.7 million US. So I think that brought everything back to the fore. Now, I had... Um, just yesterday, I had a quick poke around and had a look at some of the permissions these devices were using. And there's the Lovence one, so that's this one. That also has approximate location. Okay, it's not a specific location, but it's approximate. But the one that got me is this is a copy of the permissions from the WeVibe WeConnect app from yesterday. This is after they settled their lawsuit, and they're still collecting location data. Wow! How much do you have to sue these guys to get them to update their apps? Unbelievable. But anyway, um, this is where it all gets a bit grim. Stop it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I want a show of hands here. Has anybody not seen this story. Okay, all right, this is for you. Okay, wow, where have you been hiding? Um, this is probably singularly the most grim device I think I've ever had the pleasure of encountering. It is absolutely horrible. Um, this is called the Syme Eye, and it is a dildo camera vibrator. Ah, oh, yeah, that's what, that's what we kind of said. So, yeah, what, what do you do with... It's called the. We're not sure. It comes across as slime eye. We think actually slime eye would be better. Yeah. But yeah. So anyway, it uses Wi-Fi. And there's nothing wrong with using Wi-Fi. That's fine. It needs to use stream video, so Bluetooth probably wouldn't have enough bandwidth. Um, but what's weird, and unlike most IoT Wi-Fi devices, is it works as a wireless access point, not as a wireless client. Now, unconfigured, you'd expect it to be an AP, you configure it and flip it into a client so it can join your other devices. Yeah. Um, but it acts as a wireless access point, and it stays as a wireless access point. And that comes up with a very interesting feature in that you can use Wiggle.net to find them. <laughs> so... You can go and find people's dildos. Um, there are only actually a couple I've found on the internet so far, um, but that's in the Hecky Harbour district of Tokyo. I think that's probably a sex shop. Um, but I'm waiting for more to pop up as we go. But that's one of the really unfortunate problems with using it as an AP. Um, the other really creepy bit, so as an access point, it has a PSK. The PSK is 8 8s. What a surprise. The really freaky bit is when we started pulling apart the mobile app, things started getting a bit weird. So hopefully over here I've got it. And the Simi app... Have a look at the claim of the, some of these classes. Winged Cam. <laughs> Sky Viper. What has fundamentally happened here is there's been a serious case of code reuse. This is a dildo camera that thinks it's a drone. <laughs> um, believe it or not, there are actually propeller and motor um, control classes in the, uh, the, same, <laughs> the same APK, which is just crazy. So... Um, 
Next generation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We did think about doing a video. I don't know, a mock-up of a dildo drone. Anyway, whatever. Um, I actually managed to get... Some, somebody put me in contact with the guys at Sky Viper. Um, and they were bemused, to say the least, that their brand name was in a dildo camera APK. Um, turns out, on, on chatting to them, it's actually quite an earlier version of the camera manufactured for them by a company called Shenzhen Recam. Um, and it looks like they'd actually asked the camera provider to write the code for them. So they didn't own the IP to the code, which is a real shame, because they couldn't actually do very much about it. Um, went a little bit further. Um, and... Uh, Pulled the APK apart a bit, a, bit, uh, a bit further and found more. So I've got an IP address, so it's working as an AP, so good DHCP, 102.168.11, great, port 80, fantastic. Username, Abwin, password, blank. Get in. What could possibly go wrong at this point, Andrew? Everything, absolutely everything. <laughs> so found that, and yeah, uh, so if I, should we actually connect to it? I think it'd be fun. Yeah, I need, uh, to, get it, I need to connect to it via Wi Fi. Yeah, this is it. Can you get it up and running? Yeah. Is it actually still powered? It's got the most useless battery life, by the way, which is a real issue for a sex toy, particularly this vibrating sex toy. Do you want to see if you can get it up? Yeah, we're up. It's up. Yeah. I think we're already connected. Go, okay, pop it up in the browser. Uh, which IP is it? 1 1. one, one. There you go, image stream, fantastic. And there you go, so you can it's, now see. It's a bit difficult to see, isn't it? Yeah, so we... I think, well, there we go, that's my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get any ideas, you. Um, fine, so that's all great. So we've got a stream coming from it now. So you could quite literally go and find someone's dildo using Wiggle, sit outside their house, jump on concurrently, accept multiple concurrent connections, and stream whatever they're streaming. Um, yeah, nice, hey? Um, just lovely, but that was frankly just too easy. Let's see if we can go a bit further. Can we get a persistent root shell in a dildo? Oh, yes. <laughs> this is where it gets quite fun. So I'm not going to go into real detail on this because we scripted it because we'd have no chance of this actually working for real life. Um, it's got loads of functionality. There's loads of other crazy stuff. Do you want to show, this, show it working? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll show you how they did. So um, it, it's quite a weird device. I'll talk you through what it's got in it. So let's just um, let's jump back to the presenter. Yeah, so uh, you can see it's got, um, it's got this little Wi-Fi sock board with um, the flash memories on the other side of it. And you can see down the bottom here we've soldered pin headers on because it's just got a serial port, almost exactly like the DVR. Um, this one, I learned one thing, never give your dildo to Dave because this is what happens to it when you give him one. Yeah, um, we, we realised actually you, you had to actually take the outer sheath off and there was actually quite a method to doing that. And it, it still works though, look, <laughs> sort of. What you, what you have to do to get the plastic out of sheath off, you actually need to basically circumcise it around here. And you can do a slit down the back, and then you can peel the outer sheath off. And there are four screws in there, which is great. It works a treat. Yeah, and it still works amazingly as well. Yeah, it still works. But I mean, I, mean, I wouldn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> Those pin headers might be a little painful, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so I started playing around with it and found all the functionality you'd expect of a drone camera. Fantastic. So I had everything we needed, loads and loads of functionality. A load of functionality could effectively be in a wireless access point as well, couldn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's everything. It's got motion detection and can email you when there's motion detected as well, which I yeah. can see being useful. Yeah, very useful. <laughs> yeah. Um, spent a bit of time playing around. We actually went through the entire firmware. We monitored it over UART. Spent quite a bit of time playing with that. It was quite difficult to actually mess around with. Um, the Wi-Fi Mac points us to Shenzhen Recam. That was great. That's pretty obvious. CGIs we're playing around with. We got all the documentation found them, but we couldn't get the firmware off it. One thing we did find from them was the ability to bring up Telnet, though. So if you just sent that um, argument to the CGI script, it'll bring up Telnet. We think, fantastic. Mirai, off we go on the dildo. Great. Um, brute forced it. Nothing was working. We could not get that brute fast password to go. So we're now stuck. We now had to strip the dildo down a bit, get some... Um, test clips onto a couple of the pads and scrape the firmware from it. And that's where things got a bit interesting. Now, it took about 30 minutes to get that firmware off it on there using a bus park. But what really made things awkward was that the, um, there was no set of password. It was in a different part of the storage. It was on a flash ROM, was it? It's in NVRAM, which yeah. is stored in a different place. So, yeah, we couldn't get it. Yeah, and it's getting quite annoying at this point. We couldn't actually get all the way in. But we got lucky. My colleague was playing around. He was monitoring you up whilst sending stuff into the web interface, and he found an injection point, which is fantastic. And the point we got to was uh, here. What you need to do is go into the host IP parameters in the NFS settings in the onboard um, access point. And if you start passing a couple of weird arguments to it, you actually start um, getting mount problems, you get the file system dumps itself, and you get the contents of a set of password. Fantastic. Now we're in a good place. Um, stuck it then, though. The brute force failed. We couldn't brute the, the, um, the uh, Telnet password. We were stuffed. We couldn't get there. However, we then realized, of course, everything's running as root. So we just wrote a new root user into its set of password. 
and we're sorted. We're in a much better place now. Um, yeah, a bit annoying. Once we'd actually been through the firmware, grepped it for root, we discovered that the root password is actually recam 4 debug, which is why we didn't get it, which is a little bit annoying. So what we're going to go and try and do is actually carry out this exploit now. Um, it does take a little bit of time to run, um, but once it goes, it should open a browser window that shows us the video, um, and, well, you've taken it over. Um, we can turn it into it and do what we want to it. It's, it's crazy for a device that doesn't need this functionality in it. It's just bananas, really. Oh, there we go. It's, it's going to take a little while to do it. It takes two or three minutes to actually get it to pop, but we've now got, effectively, a persistent root shell on a sex toy, which is just utterly nuts. While we're doing that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the disclosure process that we went through. So we um, sent them an email. Um, it was Christmas Eve, but that's fine. You know, what else do you do on Christmas Eve other than exploit dildos? I don't know. Um, got nothing, no response to that, even though uh, well into January. We tried them again in mid-January. Um, we got absolutely nothing back from them again. We tried them again, got absolutely nothing back. This is standard you know, customer service. Just want a response, guys. And they just ignored us, which is, I think, probably as many of you are very familiar with. This is a very common issue. And we thought, stuff you. You know, this, this is just getting too silly now. Um, it's not good. It's really not good. It turns out that actually one of the reasons they didn't get back to us in January is because they're all at a porn conference. <laughs> Apparently that's, that's what happens in the adult toy industry. It does take a while to pop this one, unfortunately. Let's have a go. Yeah, it's not there yet. It will come. It does work. Yeah, it just took a while. There you go. Fantastic. Um, right, so what we're going to get here, we've now got a lovely persistent reach shell. We're waiting for the video to stream to come. Is that aired out or is it coming? Uh, yeah, oh, there, there we go. go. It's just a little bit slow. So yeah, now yeah. now we can you know use this to see what you want. Yeah. It also makes a really good chip inspection cam as well. It's a really good close-up cam. I might get a weird look in the office. I don't know. But some of the other things that are actually quite interesting in that root shell. Um, do you want to scroll down a bit, Andrew? We'll just talk about do down. So you, a couple of interesting things in there. Um, so you've got all the PSKs. It's got email capability. It's also got the ability to Skype. Which is quite something. And then the bit that freaked us out, do you want to pick up that IP address? It also, what was the address? It also sends data to a Chinese IP address. Whoa. That address yeah. appears to be offline now, though. But yeah, It is important to note it doesn't connect to the internet. So yeah. it's like, it's functionality that's completely yeah. unused, but it's in there. And that's the weird thing. Yeah, that's just beyond grim, isn't it? I, uh, I just find that quite creepy. Right. Should so, we test the range on it, or is that? Oh, I could do. Yeah. Now, does, does anybody want to take it up to the back? If anyone's, <laughs> no, really. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got one of these, <laughs> who's going to admit to it? Uh, we've put the Python script on our website, so you can see it there. How the exploit works. A couple of useful resources. So, Internet of Dongs is an interesting website, actually. <laughs> It's not ours. It's run by a guy called, uh, called who uses hashtag, the Twitter tag Renderman. Um, he does quite a lot of uh, research into um, sex toys and other security. He's, uh, he's trying to get the industry to up its game. Um, he had a bit of a go at me, but uh, we get on. Um, the blog's up there as well. That's fine. Um, you'll find everything you need to know to exploit the sex toy. Cost 250 US dollars. You can buy them on Amazon.co.uk. They are in stock. Can you get news on Oh, I did a... look, I did look. You did? Yeah. Oh, man, you're worse than me. <laughs> but I no. just kind of want to leave you with a couple of points here. I, I never thought in all the, all the research we've done into IoT, I'd ever put the words dildo and camera in the same sentence. But that's what happened. But anyway, that's us. That's Andrew at the top. That's me. That's the company. That's the blog. There's loads and loads of IoT research on there. Loads of great advice as well. The blog is broadly suitable for work, apart from the top story on the blog today. So if you, if you are yeah, in the office, I wouldn't recommend that just right now. Anyway, thanks very much. Any questions? <laughs> Question over here. Uh, thanks, guys. Really good. Uh we missed out the real demonstration, but maybe that's for later. Um, how come none of these IoT devices are getting recorded on CV database, databases or NVD or anything like um, that? Because I've had a quick look through, and none of the stuff that you'd be, you put on your blog is really in there. Should there not be a case of so, uh, publicly disclosing rather than just disclosing to the vendor? Um, we, we tend to disclose via the blog. Um, the, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this. Getting CVEs at the moment seems really difficult. Yeah. Unless you go through certs because of a difficult disclosure, 
and bigger impact. Fundamentally, the impact of this isn't that big. So getting a CV for it, they just don't respond. If it's, there's a lot of systems exposed, they do. Um, we do have some CVs for stuff that had bigger impact, but not much. Yeah, it tends to be IoT devices, relatively small markets. So yeah, getting set to respond. Soon. I mean, everything will be internet connected. Yeah. Every yeah. washing machine, everything will be. Every TV is in the UK. You, know, you can buy for short now. So yeah. but IoT stuff's not in CV, but it should. Yeah, I agree. I think it should be. I think, I think the problem is it's, I think, certain um, uh, are overwhelmed with the volume of submissions right now, particularly around IoT, because it's just so, so straightforward in many cases. Any further questions out there? No one else got questions? Oh, a question about a sex toy. Uh, did you clear your search history after you bought the toy? <laughs> <laughs> so, this came from on my Amazon account. You should see my recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, get that bloody thing out of the house. <laughs> I did have an a, a amusing incident, actually. Uh, my wife dropped the kids off at, off at school after I'd been out doing a talk late at night. Um, and I just left my gear in the car. She, she parks up at school, and the headmaster's office is right outside the parking spot. She opens the door, and this falls out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. There's Kayla in the back as well. Yeah, having think, a doll next to that, which yeah. just made that much worse. Yeah, yeah, Kayla was there as well. It's just all <laughs> quite odd, isn't it? Yeah. Any, any further questions? If anyone has private questions, they'd rather not share a public. We'll be around for the next half an hour or so. <laughs> Great, thanks, Jim. Thanks.